I'm glad to be here presenting uh, some of the work I did while I was a uh, postdoc at Araya, uh, working with Ryota, who you all just heard from uh, a bit earlier. And this work will be exploring a similar question that he looked at in his talk, which is, um, is there uh, any sort of meaningful connection between consciousness and artificial intelligence or intelligence in humans or other animals? Um, and if so, how can we attempt to formalize this potential connection? Um, yeah, so we motivate this work with this uh, looking at this kind of folk intuition that seems to exist in a lot of science fiction media in particular, but I think in a lot of people's general imaginations, which is that um, the super intelligent AIs are also, for some reason, uh, very sentient as well, right? So this came up uh, with this question around the Google engineer, Blake Lamone, suggesting that the large language model that he was talking to was not only very intelligent, but he was convinced that it was sentient as well, right? So where do we get this conviction from? Um, yeah, is there something that's actually useful in this conviction that we can potentially explore? So I know a lot of people here, when they say consciousness, they mean all sorts of different things. In uh, this case, we're limiting our understanding or thinking about consciousness to this more restrictive idea of cognitive information access. So not thinking necessarily about the phenomenality of consciousness, about qualia, but more about this functional distinction, which is why is it that some pieces of information in the brain we don't have conscious access to, we don't phenomenally experience, or we aren't able to report, and other pieces of information we uh, do seem to be conscious of, are able to report, and are able to kind of actively consciously manipulate. This distinction seems to imply some sort of meaningful distinction in terms of what kind of information uh, there is in these two states and what kinds of computations we can do on this information, which is, of course, uh, relevant to intelligence. So in particular, we kind of pick out uh, in this work, we looked at three contemporary theories of conscious function. Uh, and I think uh, these have all been mentioned by some speakers in the past. So I've, I imagine everyone has a, some level of familiarity with it. This are global workspace theory, information generation theory, and attention schema theory. Um, and so each of these three theories are kind of proposed uh, within separate contexts, but we attempt to provide kind of a unified computational framework for each of them, and to attempt to look at each of them from this perspective, in particular of uh, conscious access or cognitive information access. So just a brief overview of each of the three theories to refresh you. Um, so global workspace theory posits that we can kind of break the brain into these set of separate cognitive modules, and then each of these cognitive modules share information through a global shared workspace. And the idea is that the information that the agent or the being is conscious of is the information that is able to make it into this workspace. Um, and that entry into this workspace is governed by these ignition events, which are kind of this nonlinear competition system. Um, where certain information passes the threshold and makes it in, whereas other information does not. And then, of course, there's this other uh, outgoing dynamic of broadcasting, where likewise the information within the global workspace then gets selectively sent to other relevant modules within the system. Uh, then we can look at the information generation theory. Um, and so this was recently proposed by Kanai uh, colleagues. Uh, at Araya, and the idea here is that the information that is consciously experienced is not kind of like bottom-up sensory information, but is rather always kind of second-order top-down predictions. Um, and uh, Ryota uh, explained this, I think, quite well in the context of uh, thinking about variational autoencoders, for example, where the decoder of the network would be consistent with the kind of like consciously experienced bit of experience. Um, and then there are also relations to uh, kind of hierarchical predictive coding, active inference, um, and a lot of the work that Friston's group has done. Lastly, we have uh, attention schema theory, and attention schema theory proposes that uh, it's not the kind of attentional process itself which corresponds to consciousness, but rather this idea of a second order model of the attentional process and the content of this attentional model or attentional schema is in fact uh, what corresponds to this idea of consciousness. Um, so in the uh, original paper proposing this, uh, the authors used this uh, diagram that I have here on the right, where um, we'd have like a first order experience of a perceiver perceiving an apple, um, but then you could also have this idea of having like a second order meta representation of that process 
um, where not only does the perceiver perceive the apple, but the perceiver perceives themselves perceiving the apple, and that this is kind of like what uh, would be associated with consciousness. Um, we think that this is kind of particularly relevant, not just as a description of consciousness, um, but more importantly as a kind of description of this useful cognitive mechanism where we're able to kind of like meta-represent the attentional process and therefore um, dynamically modulate the attentional process, which I'll get into a bit. And so with each of these three theories, uh, here we have like very simplified diagrams, uh, kind of like attempting to lay out the high level interpretations of each of them. Um, so in the case of global workspace, you have some shared workspace where a set of cognitive modules all interact. In the case of information generation theory, we have the incoming sensory information being uh, interacting with top-down predictions from some kind of information generator. Um, and in this case, uh, we extend the idea of an information generator with the notion of a cognitive map. So there's something which is kind of governing the spatial and temporal dynamics of the information generator so that they're consistent with those of the, the world itself. Um, and then lastly, in the context of attention schema theory, um, we have some sort of attentional system over sensory, motor, cognitive processes. Um, and that this attentional system is itself modulated by the attentional schema, which is always modeling the attentional process and dynamically updating it. So that's kind of how uh, we're thinking about or approaching this idea of conscious function. Um, now for the other half of the equation about this relationship, the intelligence itself. Um, in this work, we adopt the definition of Francois Cholet that he proposed a few years ago. In particular, uh, he was looking at this question of how can we come up with a good definition of intelligence that captures not only kind of the traditional way that psychologists think about human intelligence, but also the way in which AI researchers are attempting to think about uh, artificial intelligence. And so here we have uh, kind of like a simplified version of Cholet's definition. If you're interested more, I recommend his original paper. Um, but at a high level, you can think of intelligence as the ability to acquire novel skills with little previous experience, knowledge, or uh, skill-specific priors um, as possible, right? So you can kind of formalize this if you want to have mathematical definitions of each of these. And so in his paper, he uses algorithmic information theory and provides some uh, kind of proof of concepts for being able to kind of like quantify intelligence specifically. Um, I think you can also kind of get an intuitive notion about this, where if you have two agents and they're each learning the same skill, but if one learns this skill with half as many experiences or demonstrations of that skill, for example, than the other agent, then we, uh, with uh, knowledge or priors being fixed, then we'd say that that agent is the smarter of the two. Um, likewise, an important thing that kind of falls out from this definition is that if you have uh, two agents and one agent uh, is able to accomplish uh, dozens more skills or hundreds more skills than another agent, that's actually not a useful piece of information about whether that agent is actually more intelligent or not. It could, for example, have had uh, orders of magnitude more time to learn those other skills or have been handcrafted with the ability to complete those skills, whereas another agent might not have. So we can kind of take this definition and uh, apply it roughly to the animal kingdom where uh, there's plenty of research on animal learning uh, and it's as far as things like simple associative learning, most animals are able to, within limited domains, uh, be able to learn like associative relationships between things, but these are often uh, require vast amounts of uh, demonstrations for the animal to learn. Uh, we move up to uh, animals with kind of more complex brains, like various forms of mammals and birds, and we find here that they're able to learn a wider variety of different skills, um, but compared to humans, it often requires uh, orders of magnitude more examples, right? Um, so whereas a human might learn something with two or three examples, it might take 20 or 30 or 200 or 300 for the rodent to learn the same thing. Then kind of at the highest level, you know, humans, like I'm saying, are able to learn things with relatively few priors knowledge very quickly, little experience this is kind of captured in the concept of few shot or one shot learning. Um, so by this definition, humans are more generally intelligent than most other animals, but of course, um, humans are not themselves perfectly generally intelligent. Um, there are a lot of pre-existing priors that humans are born with. There's a lot of literature around, for example, this idea that humans might have priors for language. 
um, which allow them then to learn language uh, much more rapidly than other animals like chimpanzees, for example. We can then uh, look at intelligence and artificial agents, where over the course of the past decade, there's been amazing developments in the context of deep learning models, being able to solve all sorts of complicated tasks, like beating humans at uh, games like Go, and being able to uh, code HTML websites from text descriptions. These are complicated things that, as far as we know, only humans can do up until a few years ago. Um, so it would seem that these agents are quite intelligent, but if we apply Francois Cholet's definition of intelligence, we find uh, that they may be less impressive. So uh, for each of these kinds of tasks, like playing Go or generating code, uh, these models are trained on uh, huge, incredibly huge data sets, right? Um, so the amount of games that Lisa Dole had to play to become a uh, top player in Go is orders of magnitude fewer than the amount of games that AlphaGo simulated or was trained on to be able to beat Lisa Dole. And some seem to think that uh, if we just keep scaling up these models indefinitely, then eventually they'll get this generally intelligent ability. Uh, but this is questioned by various kind of critics of this approach, like Gary Marcus. OK, so we kind of have an idea of what we mean by conscious function. And we have a bit of an idea uh, about what we mean by intelligence. And so one of the things I was interested in is, well, is there a specific cognitive ability or a set of cognitive abilities that kind of exist at the intersection of these two things? Something that we know that humans are able to do that is explicitly conscious, that is associated clearly with general intelligence uh, as far as the kind of Cholet-like definition is concerned, um, and something that artificial innate agents currently don't do, but if they were able to, we'd imagine, would lead to greater intelligence. So um, the thing that I thought about, because um, my background, I guess, is in like studying the hippocampus and uh, episodic memory, is uh, I was thinking about Enzo Tolving and his idea of mental time travel. Right? And so mental time travel is this kind of particular ability uh, to project oneself into the past or the future and act out a scenario in that past or future. And the important thing is that this is a, doesn't have to be something that really happens. It could be anything. Um, and so it's also something that's explicitly conscious. So humans don't do this uh, when they're not conscious. Um, and it's intimately related to intelligent behavior, right? So to be able to uh, land a human on the moon, uh, a whole lot of humans had to be able to mentally time travel and project various possible futures that uh, literally never existed yet um, to be able to uh, make something like this happen. And a number of theorists have kind of argued uh, by looking at the animal learning literature um, that it seems that humans uh, are certainly likely to be the only uh, animals capable of this. Maybe some of the great apes can do something similar. Uh, it's kind of a position of debate. But I think what's not up for debate is that uh, no artificial agents are capable of this kind of thing right now. So uh, certainly a lot of animals and artificial agents are capable of things that might be similar. Um, so we kind of propose this taxonomy of four levels of what we call experience generation. Um, the first being direct experience. So that's just like moment to moment phenomenal experience. Uh, all artificial agents or humans are kind of capable of this. Uh, we then have this idea of replay, which is that you're able to generate uh, trajectories of experience from the kind of set of experiences that you've already had. Then preplay is this kind of more advanced thing, which is within the context of a uh, environments or tasks that you've already seen, or your current environment or task, you're able to uh, generate a novel trajectory. Right? And so the ability to generate this kind of novel trajectory is probably more consistent with this idea of intelligence. Um, but it's somewhat limited compared to kind of the full uh, implications of mental time travel, right? So in, in mental time travel, uh, humans who are capable of this are not only able to generate possible trajectories in the past that they've already seen, but are able to generate consistent possible environments in which these possible trajectories might play themselves out. So for example, no one had ever been to the moon, right? And so the moon is this kind of possible unexplored environment in which we're able to, uh, given our knowledge of the world, create a consistent idea of, and then consistently mentally project ourselves into. 
So to just explore this idea in animals and artificial agents a little bit more clearly, um, like I said, of course, animals have direct experience. Um, there's also a lot of research in mammals and uh, various birds showing that uh, and these animals kind of consistently do this thing uh, where they're able to replay previous exper experiences, right? So the rat is walking through a linear maze. It has a sequence of place cells that fire at its hippocampus. When it gets to the end of the maze, it eats its food, but then it'll replay back very quickly the sequence of activations. Um, but I think it's pretty clear that replay isn't quite conscious, um, and it's also, uh, while it's relevant to intelligence and learning, it's, it doesn't quite uh, get to the breadth of mental time travel. There's also evidence for preplay in, in rodents and mammals, um, where the animal is able to generate uh, within a known environment uh, hypothetical trajectories, right? So there was this great study done a few years ago um, where they had a rodent in a novel tea maze that it had never seen before, and they put up a barrier right before the tea of the maze. And they let the rodent run around, and then they introduced a uh, goal location, like some food in the upper right hand of the tea maze. Then they let the agent see that food, but not actually get to it. They let the rodent take a little nap, and then they opened up the maze and they let it walk around, right? And what they found basically was that the place cell trajectories at the, in the final stage, when it actually went to the uh, goal location where the food was, were consistent with some of the imagined trajectories or the pre-play trajectories that the rodents uh, had activated during its second rest phase. So this suggests that by seeing the environment that it's in, seeing some desirable location, stopping having this pre-play happen in the rodent's brain, it was uh, imagining itself going to a place that it had never been in order to get the food, right? Um, but this isn't quite uh, mental time travel because the, uh, the rodent um, was able to see it, right? So it was able to pretty quick, uh, like easily understand this. Uh, in mental time travel, you have to kind of not be able to see it. It has to be an unseen environment. So there's some interesting work uh, around great apes, which suggests that they get a little bit closer to this, where for unseen scenarios that are uh, irrelevant to the current context, they're able to, in some limited contexts, um, find tools uh, and you bring them so that they can use them later. We can then look at artificial agents, right? And so they have direct experience in the sense that uh, if you have an embedded agent in some environment, it's of course getting sensory observation, something like this. Um, as far as replay is concerned, uh, this idea of replay is applied to the DQN network, which was used to play Atari at superhuman level. Um, and so that's kind of like a quite popular approach in the field. Um, moving a little bit beyond that to preplay, uh, this kind of becomes the domain of these model-based reinforcement learning algorithms, where you train some sort of predictive model of the environment, and the hope is that when you would then unroll that model, you're going to not only unroll uh, sequences of experiences that the agent has already had, but hypothetical new sequences of experience um, that are then useful, right, for planning or something like this. But the limitation, of course, is that they're constrained to the context of the current environment, right? So your uh, predictive model, like the one that I'm showing here, uh, which is the dreamer model uh, from Google, it's even at Google Brain, is only ever going to predict trajectories that are consistent with environments that it's already seen. Um, so in this way, it doesn't quite reach the level of mental time travel either. Um, OK, so what does mental time travel have to do with these uh, theories of consciousness that I've been talking about? I think an interesting kind of motivating example here uh, that I was thinking about uh, when working through this is uh, Marcel Proust's uh, Remembrance of Lost Time. Uh, I don't know how many people show hands who's read <laughs> this book. Oh, nice, yeah, a few people, cool. Um, even if you haven't read it, uh, there's a like very famous scene in it which is like replicated all over culture. Um, so like he's uh, in his like middle age, he's sitting down to like tea and he has the Madeleine cake and he tastes the cake, and the taste of the cake kind of brings back all of these memories from his childhood. And this is kind of how the book starts. So like, oh, he's brought back to his childhood, and then he recalls basically his entire life from that point onward. Um, so I think this is a nice example of mental time travel, where he uh, is kind of like creatively re-experiencing his past. Um, but it's also an example of how each of these three functional theories of consciousness, I think, are all essential 
to getting mental time travel out. Right, so at the very first, uh, he tastes the cake. This is like a sensory, one sensory modality that uh, has an ignition event, which allows it to enter his conscious experience, the global workspace. It then gets broadcast to his long-term memory system, which then recalls these memories from childhood that he hadn't had for many decades. Um, this then uh, starts him on this kind of like creative mental recollection, uh, which is what the information generation theory would suggest, right? Um, and then lastly, he is himself consciously aware of this experience. Um, he knows that he is remembering the past. He doesn't like mistake it for reality or he doesn't get lost in it or anything like this. In fact, he's able to write a novel about it. So I think this uh, kind of suggests that each of these three functional theories of consciousness can work together within a single system and that the single system um, is uh, going to be necessary, though still maybe not totally sufficient. I think there's maybe a few little uh, pieces to tweak or figure out here or there, but it should be uh, largely uh, most of the pieces kind of necessary for uh, mental time travel. And I think this kind of provides a bit of a blueprint that can be then used for uh, motivating artificial intelligence research. I think this blueprint uh, would look something like this triangle here. Right, so we have these three different theories and uh, you can imagine implementing each of these components in artificial agents and then you can imagine implementing kind of like uh, conjunctions of these components. And my argument would be that to get to this mental time travel, you have to actually implement all three of these components in a consistent way. So as far as information generation is concerned, the past few years there have been some very impressive uh, text conditional generative models like DALI here. Um, there have also been some really great work uh, kind of looking at computational models of the cognitive mapping process that happens in the hippocampus, the medial temporal lobe, um, that's able to learn these meaningful temporally and spatially structured um, representations. If we look at global workspace, uh, I'm citing two uh, Goyal papers here. Uh, so this is both work out of uh, Yashua Benjo's lab, who's been very interested in uh, consciousness, in particular, interested in this kind of global workspace approach. Um, so at the top, there's uh, kind of like this explicit global workspace model, which they've worked on. At the bottom, uh, there's this recurrent independent mechanisms approach, where they attempt to like learn a set of independent cognitive modules that then share information between one another. Uh, lastly, yeah, there's been work attempting to implement uh, attention schemas as well in uh, reinforcement learning agents. Uh, so the work at the top kind of shows that if you have this attention schema, the agent's able to uh, solve the task much better than if you don't. Um, I think this idea of attention schema and meta-representation is related to some of this work looking at like meta-representations in the prefrontal cortex, for example, where you have some learned meta-controller that's able to modulate its policy based on uh, the sequence of experiences. We can then look at uh, models that attempt to kind of combine these things. They start to become more complex, but they also uh, become more functional, I think, as a result. Um, so there's more work out of NGO's lab, uh, the top example here, where they burn both a kind of global workspace information bottleneck, as well as a dynamical model of the environment, a predictive model of the environment. Um, there's the great work we heard about yesterday, the conscious Turing machine. Uh, where they learn this global, or they describe this kind of global workspace type architecture, um, where a world model is also kind of an essential aspect of this. There's also the work that Ryota was discussing earlier, um, which I think uh, my interpretation of this is it kind of fits into this global workspace attention schema theory, where instead of the global workspace being a shared kind of like set of sensory modalities that all have a shared latent embedding, it's a kind of higher level representation where the set of embeddings are of policies themselves or over kind of like intentional policies. I know, uh, yeah, so I'm short on time. I'm going to go straight to this center one, which is the section of this question of like, okay, well, what about all three? Um, I don't think any uh, current AI systems are able to kind of give us real mental time travel as defined by Andal Tolving, um, but I think it is not impossible. I think this kind of like is it one potential roadmap we can follow to get there? So as far as conclusions, I think exploring these functional theories of consciousness in kind of like uh, specific computational terms, thinking about how they can be implemented in AI systems is going to give us a lot as far as getting more 
truly, genuinely intelligent agents, and not just agents that with uh, millions of dollars of compute can perform impressive skills. Um, and I think amounts of time travel is a very interesting benchmark for intelligence. Lastly, going back to the original question that I asked about consciousness intelligence, I think if we take consciousness and kind of define it more limitedly as cognitive information access, and we say that uh, these functional theories we're looking at are necessary for mental time travel, and mental time travel does indeed make agents intelligent, then we can say that there is a useful link between consciousness and intelligence. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank my collaborators, in particular uh, Kai, who uh, helped me do many revisions of this paper. Yeah, happy to take questions. Thank you.